When our life story becomes a part of God's story of redemption, it becomes a testimony and an invitation for all to experience God's goodness and love. This message is an invitation to share our stories. This Sunday, um, we're just going to look at this message, um, and I just titled it's a simple word of encouragement, and um, just titled "Let Us SOS." Okay, let us SOS. And I think we all know what SOS stands for, uh, what SOS means. Like it's a, it's a worldwide distress signal for help, immediate help. SOS, which means help, I'm in danger. And uh, apparently it was in 1905 when the German, German government uh, developed this. And, uh, and there were many theories. Or oh, 1908 is when they actually used it, started implementing it, and the ships... Uh, it was used in uh, ships, and uh, they would, you know, radio the signal, and, and it would go like um, dot 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 dash 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 dot dot dot, right? Uh, SOS. So there were many theories. What does SOS stand for? But apparently, in Moscow, this is the simplest way of typing out, you know, dot 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 dash 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 dot dot dot, and it would just say, you know, we're in danger, uh, help. Uh, uh, and um, but this morning, the uh, you know, the acronym that we are using is share our story. Okay? Share our story. Stories are really very powerful. They're very interesting, very powerful. And I'm sure that, you know, in our childhood, if uh, somebody had told stories, that's, you know, they were the favorite, most favorite person. In, right? I'm sure you have an uncle, a grandfather, someone who told us stories, who... Uh, you know, who shared stories and we have fond memories of them, right? And uh, I have fond memories of my grandfather, right? My mother's father. And uh, he, would, he would have this database of stories, right? And um, of course, all fairy tales and all fiction. And he would just, every summer when we had our vacation, we would, we would go and say, Tata, you know, tell us a story. It will be after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch. And he would tell us, and sometimes it will be the same old story. You know, we've heard the last year. But we would just lose ourselves, just immerse ourselves. And we would just visualize, we were, we'd be part of that story. Where we can, I, I remember some of the stories that he shared. and uh, One about a wooden horse, which would fly. And you turn the year and it would fly. And you turn the other year and do something. And but the thing is, you know, at sometimes he would just bring us down to earth. He'd say, okay, this prince and this princess, uh, they, had, they finally they married and I went to their wedding and in that wedding they gave me this shirt. You know, then we'd be like, why did you say that? You know, why did you, why did you spoil the fun? Because he'd be just so lost in that. Stories. Um, and real life stories even more so. Right? Real people, real challenges, uh, real problems, real victories, real life stories. And uh, when we hear or when we, you know, nowadays, a lot of stories being passed around and WhatsApp and social media and so on. But when we hear these stories, they inspire us. We want to do something. They, they move us to do something. They motivate us. They're like, uh, oh, I'm encouraged. I want to do something about it now. Uh, I've been sitting on this for a long time, but now you know, I've heard the story and this is some person whom I could relate to and I want to do something about it. So they educate us, they motivate us, they inspire us and, and uh, instill moral values. You know, I don't know if you remember, you know, Aesop's fables, right? The fox that tried to, you know, this is not a real life story, but Aesop's fables that tried to grape, uh, get the grape from the vine. It would keep jumping and then finally what did it say? said, uh, you know, ah, it must be too sour. I don't know. And then the moral of it is what? There's a moral to it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the moral is that, you know, just because you didn't get it, just don't talk negative about it. You know, sour grapes. Ah, you know, I don't get it. Maybe it's not worth it. So, you know, some of these stories instill moral values. And the Bible is full of stories, real life stories, real people. There's no glossing over their life, real problems. Some of them were so flawed, character-wise. And the Bible doesn't gloss over. 
He says, this is what it was. This was his problem. This is what he did. And sometimes we are so embarrassed reading it. Oh man, how could this guy do this? Real problems. As much as real life stories can motivate, inspire, and uh, reform us to a certain degree, real life stories in the Bible have that additional ingredient. Because these are stories of faith. And these are stories which have the God of heaven and earth engaging with people. The Lord of heaven and earth doing something in their lives, coming through in their lives. So when we read them, not only are we motivated, inspired, but there's something that happens in them. It instills faith in us. It instills faith in us. It also is an invitation for us. It's not like, okay, um, we read this story and then, okay, that was good. It's a good story for that time, but now, you know, times have changed. No, no. Though those people are dead, their lives still speak. The stories still speak. It's a testimony. It's pointing to God. It's pointing to the reality of what God can do in our lives. And it's actually an invitation. An invitation to say, open the door, let him in, and he'll do it again. Every real life story in the Bible is an invitation. An invitation for the Lord to come in and do it again. Do what he did for those people in our times, in our day, in our lives. And personally saying, Lord, do it again for me. Okay. So let's just pretend that um, we are at a campfire. Okay. There's a campfire and we're all gathered around the campfire and uh, just passing the mic, passing the mic around and there are some real life stories which these people are sharing. Okay. Can you pretend that you're a little quiet here? Can we pretend that? There's a campfire right in the middle and they're all seated around and, uh, and they're just passing the mic and and people are sharing, they're testifying. Because, you know, if God can do it in their lives, He can do it for us. And that's one of the things that they will testify over and over again. So, so the mic goes to Abraham. Okay, so Abraham just readies himself and he says, Okay, <clears throat> clears his throat. Let's go. This is my story. You know, I was minding my business. I was doing what I was doing. Genesis chapter 12. And Abraham would say, you know, the Lord met me and the Lord spoke to me. The Lord said, come out of your land, come out of your family and go to where I'm showing you. And there I'm going to make you a nation. And you'll be the father of many nations. And in you, families will be blessed. But Abraham says, wow, it's good. Okay, I'll do it. There's one problem. Oh, we don't have children. And by the way, we are about 75 years old. But Abraham says, okay, God, I'll do it. And so Genesis 12, we see Abraham. Uh, I, by the way, he's called Abram in Genesis 12. Um, and then God visits him in Genesis 15 again. And he reiterates that promise to Abraham. So Abraham would say, you know, God visited me again. And this time he took me out of my tent and he showed me the sky and he said, Abraham, uh, Abraham, try counting the stars, Abraham. So Abraham looks up and he says, okay, one, two, three, four, five, thousand and one. Oh God, I don't know. Sarah calls him for dinner and then he goes, where did I leave? No. God says, you know, as innumerable as the stars, so will be your offspring. So every time Abraham looks at the stars and he's reminded of the promise. Oh God, this is what you said. But God, I don't see it, but this is what you said. And all he has is God's word. All he has is that promise. So Abraham would say, you know, all I had was this promise. God, every time I'd look up, I'll see the stars and I'll be reminded of the promise of God. 
But you know, I had some serious character flaws, Abraham would say. Abraham would say. It says, he, you know, under pressure, I will buckle down. I did the same thing with Abimelech. I took, Abhi, I, I took Sarah, my wife, and I was going, and Abimelech came, and I just said, you know, I was so overawed, intimidated. I, I said, she's my sister. But yeah, there's some family connection, but still, you know, I, I said that. And so here, he's under pressure again. Sarah is saying, you know, what is this? You're saying God has promised, okay, do something now. Hagar, Ishmael. So Abraham would say, you know, I had some serious character flaws, man. Serious limitations. But I'm holding on to this promise. I don't know why God gave me this promise, but I'm holding on. And Abraham would say, God visited me again. And this time he's much older. Genesis 17. And Abraham would say, you know what? God changed my name. He says, Abraham, which means exalted father, you will be called Abraham. Just father of many, father of multitudes. He changed my name. So every time somebody called, every time Sarah would call me Abraham, I'd be reminded of the promise of God. I'm reminded of the promise of God. I'm reminded of my conversation with God. I'm reminded of my encounter with God. You know what? I'm holding on. I'm going to hold on. And then we see in um, Genesis 21, we see, I'm um, sorry, before that, Genesis 18, and where he has this encounter with the messengers from heaven, there's this question they ask in verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So I believe Abraham would talk to us, some of us, you know, as he's holding on to the mic and he's saying, guys, I want to tell you, you know, is, I want to ask you this question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, I walked with him for two and a half decades and I, all I had was a promise. And all I could see was the stars and all I could hear was my name being called and reminded of the promise. And he would say, is anything too hard for the Lord? And I believe that, you know, that question he's asking some of us right around the campfire and saying, guys, is anything too hard for the Lord? And I believe he would pass on the mic to, to Joseph he would pass on the mic to Joseph and Joseph would take the mic and say, okay, it's my turn now. Uh, it's going to be a long story, but it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a pretty story. But it's, uh, I've been through a lot of suffering, Joseph would say. I went through a lot of suffering, suffering like you've never ever imagined. Guys, my family disowned me. My own brothers, they sold me into slavery, Joseph would say. They sold me into slavery. Then he would look at us and ask, you know, did you, have you guys experienced that? He said, no. You? No. They sold me into slavery. I was taken to a far off land and there I was made to work in this man's house called Potiphar. And there Potiphar's wife tries to seduce me. Now just an aside, Joseph is away from home. He's away from church. He's away from fellowship. He's away from life group. He's away from, a, you know, anything that you can call a holy or spiritual environment. He's in a pagan nation. He's in this household. And this woman is seducing him. And it, not, it doesn't happen just once, but it happens day after day after day. And he says one thing. He says, you know, my master, Potiphar, he doesn't know anything about this house. He trusts me so much. He's given me the keys for everything. And you are his wife. How can I do this great injustice against God? Wow. What a perspective. And before that, Potiphar says, something's different about this guy. Everything that he touches prospers. There's an excellent spirit. And he says, how can I do this great injustice? But then charges are framed and he's falsely implicated and he's thrown into prison. And in prison, Joseph says, in prison I, I did my best. So much so that the keeper of the prison just gave me full charge. Full in charge of the place. 
So I did my best. I did excellently. And Joseph would say, there were two guys, a butler and a baker. They had a dream. I interpreted the dream for them and it came true. And I told the butler, you know, just put in a word because you're going back to serve in the king's palace. Just put in a word for me. But he forgot me. He forgot all about it for two years. Right? It's a long time. And all this while, Joseph is in prison. And he's doing an excellent work. And I believe he would testify and he would, he would tell some of us. Now, wherever you are, you know, do your best. Be excellent. Be excellent. And, and after two years, the Pharaoh has a dream. He has two dreams. And uh, then the butler remembers, oh, there was this Hebrew gentleman in prison with me. And he actually interpret, interpreted the dream for me. And maybe we should ask him because no one else in the land could interpret. Not the magicians, uh, not those who are in, involved in witchcraft and so on. They couldn't interpret. So maybe we should call him. So Joseph is called and, uh, and the Pharaoh narrates the dream. And Joseph says this. He says, you know, interpretation belongs to God. He gives the interpretation. It's not me. I'm not the expert. I'm just going to lean on God. And he shares the interpretation. And the dream, we all know the dream, right? Um, seven cattle coming out and being devoured by seven gaunt and thin cattle and the years of corn, again, being devoured by those sickly years of corn. And, and Joseph says, you know, this is what it is. I, I interpreted the dream. I told them that there will be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, all the very best. You put me in prison, all the very best, guys. Seven years of famine, go for it. King, you do not know God. Seven years of famine, God's judgment, fire and brimstone, take it. No. He says, you know, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, but, you know, this is something that we can do. Here's a suggestion. Why don't we have granaries? Why don't we you know, store all the grains and we can sell those grain and, and uh, during the time of famine. So he's giving a suggestion and, and even in that time, even in that environment. And, and the Pharaoh says, he's going to be second to me in the land. He's going to be second to me. That's it. So he comes out, he's, he's there and everywhere they go, he's in the chariot and people kneel. They kneel before Joseph. And Joseph would say, guys, I don't know what's happening, but God was with me in the prison. God was with me. And he enabled me to keep a righteous heart. And the story doesn't end there. At the end, the family comes. The brothers who sold him into slavery, they come. Now, now is payback time, right? You take the grain, but I'm going to give it to you now. Give something else to you. The brothers come and he says, what you meant for evil, God has actually turned it around. So he would tell us around the campfire, you know, hold on to your integrity. Hold on to your integrity. And we are going through those seasons, tough times, and, and, and you, maybe there are more questions than answers. Hold on to your integrity and hold on to what God has called you to do. And I believe he would say, what the enemy means for evil God will turn it around for good. And I believe he's speaking to some of us this morning and saying what the enemy means for evil, God will turn around for good. And he would pass on the mic to Joshua. And, uh, and Joshua says, uh, I'll pass. No, he takes the mic and Joshua says, okay, this is, guys, this is interesting. I was with Moses. Moses is a larger than life figure. I've seen Moses, I've seen the signs, I've seen the wonders. I've seen him, you know, see the water come out of the rock. I've seen him do all that. And I've seen him struggle. I've seen him go through pain. I've seen him come to a point where he said, God, just take my life. These people are too much. These people are grumbling. They want, they want you know, they want garlic and leek and they... 
you know all those things just it's too much lord and jo- and joshua is at that time and and uh, for joshua this was moses the mentor the father figure now jo- moses is dead and you look at joshua chapter 1 moses is dead the one he, whom he could lean on the one whom whom he could always lean on for wisdom he is dead he's no more and he has an encounter with god so joshua would say you know he was more he was like a father to me and i believe he would speak to some of us this morning who were saying you know this person meant so much they are like father they are like a mother the source of wisdom so a pillar of strength but they are not there in the scene they are not there anymore they are not there anymore and i believe joshua would tell us about his encounter with god where god comes and he's so blunt he says moses my servant is dead that should you know just take the wind out of joshua right? moses my servant is dead but now joshua he says as i was with moses so i will be with you i was with moses when he led you saw how he led you saw the signs and wonders performed you saw the things that he did as i was with moses joshua i will be with you and i believe the lord would say that to some of us as i was with that father figure with that mother so i will be with you he says i will be with you wherever you go only do not be afraid be of good courage do not be fearful be of good courage and joshua receives that word he goes tells the people and uh, and then the people they say something you know he, the same people who have rebelled and he's seen them in different seasons and and talk ill of moses and so on and they say we are with you joshua we are with you joshua and they say something they say be strong do not fear be strong and courageous same words which the lord spoke, spoke to joshua the same words they repeat and for him it it must have been so encouraging to hear the word that the lord spoke to him confirmed by the people that he's going to be leading so he leads and then we move on to um, uh we move on to Joshua chapter 6 and they come to this walled city called Jericho okay is everybody listening okay is staying with the campfire okay they come to this walled city Jericho apparently the wall is so big that two chariots can actually go parallelly right so big walled city and uh, god has given them possession of the promised land and they have to take possession of it they come to the uh come to Jericho and God gives a very interesting strategy for Joshua. He says, Joshua, this is what I need you to go. It's very simple. Take the guys, go around the place seven times. Okay, seven days, six days, once a day. Seventh day, seven times. And uh, at your signal, you know, they will shout and uh, yeah, that's about it. We'll take it from there. You know, Joshua, I don't know what went on in Joshua's mind, but but Joshua seen the supernatural he has seen the supernatural hand of god under moses and so joshua says okay god whatever i'll do it lord i'll do it six times and i got it okay so he tells the people guys this is what we are going to do we're going to go around the wall six times okay so tomorrow's monday let's start okay so monday everybody goes around once okay that's done tuesday one more time good wednesday one more time okay guys we got to, only some a few more days hang in there we'll do it and then sixth day they do one more time now joshua must be thinking oh tomorrow's day 7 tomorrow's day 7 something needs to happen i have the promise of god i have the instruction from god tomorrow's day 7 and they go around that wall once twice thrice the fourth time the fifth time and the sixth time and the wall is still there 
Can you just imagine Joshua looking at the wall? Okay, sixth time. I have the promise. Uh, something's going to happen now. I have the promise of God. Yeah, he, I saw him with Moses. Yeah, yeah. I know. He, he, was, he, he, didn't, he didn't let Moses down. Yeah, no, he's with me. You know, Elevation Church has written a beautiful song about it. It's called um, The Promise Still Stands. It's about this incident where Joshua sees the wall and it's standing, but there's something else which is standing. The wall is standing, yes, strong, foreboding, big wall, strong, but there's something else that is standing. And that's the word of God, the promise of God. The wall is there. There's something else that Joshua is looking at, the promise of God. And the song goes, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I just want to read out the words of the song. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, and this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. And in the bridge, I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. And I believe Joshua would hand over the mic and say, the promise still stands. God's promise still stands. As real as the wall is, even more real is his promise because the worlds were framed by the word of God. The things that are seen were made by things that are visible. Therefore, making the things, the building material, what is invisible, so real. And then we move on to, uh, okay, anybody want to hear the testimonies or you want to cut it short? Shall we move on to some more testimonies? Okay. So there's Gideon and Gideon would say, um, God knows my true potential. He was actually threshing grain in the wine press because every time the Amalekites would come, the Canaanites would come, they would, they would make a mess of the harvest. And so he's actually undercover and he's hiding. And, and the greeting is this. You man of valor. You man of valor. You woman of valor. And Gideon's response is, I think you've got the wrong number. We are the least of the tribe. I'm the least in my family. What you say has no connection. Um, I think it's the wrong address. But God doesn't let go. He pursues. And he says, go, have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? And he sends him with an instruction. You need to bring down these altars. And uh, Gideon is like, I'm a little scared, so I'll do it in the night when nobody's watching. But he does that anyway. And God says, you know, this is what I want you to do. I want to go to the enemy's camp and I want you to do this. And uh, Gideon is like, God, uh, I just want to make sure, right? I really want to make sure. He puts out the fleece and we know that story. Let the fleece be wet, let the ground be dry. Let the ground be wet, let the field fleas be dry. He does, does that. And then all proof is given and he goes. You man of valor. Arise, O man of valor. God sees the, the tree 
inside the mango tree. Now, sometimes when God speaks to us, the word comes to us and we, we think that cannot be me. But he knows our true potential. He knows that with him, we are more than conquerors. So Gideon would give the mic to Peter and, uh, and we turn to, you know, uh, Peter just he has a lot to say. Um, he, he's very animated and uh, he's, uh, you know, jumping up and down. He's, got the, he's not sitting around the campfire anymore. He's walking. He's got the mic. He's walking around and he's saying, guys, you know, he's shaking people. I've got something to say. You need to listen. Like Luke chapter 5 goes to and he says, you know, this is what happened. I, we, we worked all night. I was washing my net, which means fishing is over. And the Lord Jesus comes and says, you know, put out the bo- boats out into the sea and I want to preach. So my boats became uh, an instant podium. And it wasn't, you know, it was a podium there, floating podium, if you want to call it. And, and God, you know, the Lord Jesus, he taught the multitudes. So... I was washing the nets, but, you know, I couldn't help some of the things that he was speaking, some of the things he was teaching, and, yeah, good stuff, interesting. But then he, after the message, he turns and looks at me and he says, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Now, that's where I had a problem, Peter would say. I'm the fisherman, he's the teacher, and the teacher is telling the fisherman, go out, launch out into the deep. You know, and Peter would say, you know, I was just by this lake of Gennesaret and um, there are many cafes there and I just wanted to go and get the strongest black coffee. And, you know, I don't want to, I've worked all night and now in the morning I've heard a message, right? Anybody like that? You worked in the night and you, you know, heard a message this morning and it's like, I'm ready to go. I want to have my coffee and then go back home and just, you know, just forget about all this. Uh, We didn't catch anything. But he says, you know, Lord, I fished all night. I didn't catch anything. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down. I will let down the net. At your word, Lord. You said so many things and I believe something happened in my heart when you were speaking. Something stirred. I'm letting down the net. And he lets down the net and he's amazed. It's full. It's so full that they had to ask the other guys, Hey guys, come help. I think... uh, we are having a problem here. Yeah, it's a good problem, but we are having a problem here. We need your help. So they catch the fish and Peter cannot take it. He just drops down in front of the Lord Jesus and says, Lord, just go away, God. Just go away. Depart from me. You know, in your presence, I just realize my sinfulness. All my limitations and everything. Oh, it just comes to me. Just go away, God. Depart from me. And the Lord says, Peter, you follow me. Peter, you follow me. For in you following me, I'm going to be making you into all that you were meant to be. You think fishing is your business? There's all there to it. I'm calling you to an exciting life, Peter. Come, walk with me. You'll be a fishers of men. Follow me. And I believe Peter would testify to some of us saying, you know, why are you putting off that decision to follow the Lord? Why are you resisting him? It's a great life. It's an exciting life. And so, so he and Peter, Andrew, James, John, they say, okay, come on, let's do it. They, they follow him. They sign up. They follow him. And it's an exciting life for three and a half years. Exciting. Can you just believe it? You know, blind Bartimaeus opens his eyes. Oh, God. Peter goes, he says, is this what happened right now? Andrew, just pinch me. Am I really awake? Lazarus comes forth, comes alive. An exciting life with the Savior. Three and a half years. They're just, they're just following him. God, you know, let this not stop. And suddenly, there seems to be a tragic, you know, interlude. And they're at the Sanhedrin, and that night uh, from the garden, he's taken there, and, and, and Peter's afraid. Peter's afraid. Someone comes to him and says, I saw you with that man. Somehow related, aren't you? You're part of that team. And Peter says, the one who was so excited, the one who traveled, the one who went with him, the one who saw these miracles. Peter says, I don't know him. That man? That, no, I don't know. That other one, I know. This I know. I don't know. 
I don't know him. And someone else comes and says, no, we are sure. We are sure that you were with him. He says, I don't, I don't know. And the third time, you know, one of the gospels says that he actually began to swore and to be angry and threw up a tantrum and he says, are you guys out of your mind? I don't know this person. I don't know this Jesus. I don't know him at all. And um, just then the rooster crows and he's reminded of the words of the Savior. And the Lord looks back at him, looks at him, and he just melts down. He weeps. And the Lord is crucified and they're all afraid and they don't know what's going to happen. And in John 21, we, we read another incident. And it's again a fishing incident. And, and this time, Peter says, okay, we don't have anything to do. I'm going to fish. Then everyone else says, we will also come with you. Let's all go fish. So they're all fishing. And again, they catch nothing. Right? And the Lord is watching them. And he says, well, have you caught anything? And Peter says, no. I mean, there is one of them says, we don't have caught anything. And the Lord says, let down your nets on the other side. On the other side. Oh, I'm surrounded by water. What other side? You know, I've tried all sides. Put here, there. What other side? But they do that. And again, when they see that miracle, when they see the word of the Lord come to pass, they, Peter again does something. He just jumps into the water. He swims to the shore. And the Lord restores him. The Lord asks him, Peter, do you love me? He asks him thrice. And I believe he used different words for love. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? He restored him back. He restored, and I believe Peter would, you know, speak to some of us and say, um, yeah, yeah, you had some great times with the Lord. You had some great times of ministry with the Lord. But there came a point when you said, uh, this is not for me. This is not for me. And he said, I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. I, I just don't want to remember that anymore. But I believe the Lord would say, I believe Peter would say, you know, it's time for restoration. It's time for restoration. The Lord would restore. And, uh, and on and on. So, um, so Peter would say, Jesus taught me how to fish. Really. And despite my unfaithfulness, he remains faithful. I think we've got time for just one more. The woman at the well would say, Jesus told me all that I ever did. I can't stop talking about him. Now I know what it means to truly live. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he would say, in short, I want to say, you know, he was a man in short, short stage. He would say, in short, I want to say that I've never met anyone like Jesus. I want to be with him. I want to be like him. If we come to the woman caught in adultery and and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a powerful story because she was caught in the very act. That's what the people come and say that. And it's a very vulnerable moment for her because the man whom she was with is not there. She must have thought at least, you know, he would be some kind of comfort, some support. Everybody's gone. Everybody's gone. So I believe she would say, you know, I was completely alone completely alone. I just felt voices of accusation. I heard voices of accusation from accusation from all angles. I was completely alone. I was all alone. I didn't know what would happen the next minute. I am prepared to die. This is the end. My life has not been great, nothing to boast about, but it's coming to an end. It's come to this. A shameful end. The Lord looks at her. The Lord asks the question to the accusers. You know, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the Lord looks at her after the crowd is gone. And where are your accusers? She says, I don't know, Lord. They've all gone. The Lord says, so I don't accuse you. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he didn't brush aside the sin. He didn't condemn her for it. But he actually pointed out 
He pointed out and said, what you're doing is wrong. Don't do it anymore. Don't continue in it. Go and sin no more. And I believe the woman at, uh, the, this woman would, um, would testify and say, Jesus did not condemn me. He forgave me instead. He restored my dignity. He restored my dignity. I can finally lift my head up and walk. I can finally lift my head up and walk. And I believe she's testifying to some of us and he's saying, you know, my savior, he can do it again. He can do it again in your life. You don't have to walk with your head down anymore. You don't have to avoid the eyes of people anymore. Jesus will restore everything that you've lost. More importantly, he'll restore your dignity. And I believe that each of these people who are testifying, you know, these are real stories, real people, not perfect people, and they're telling us something. They're saying, why don't you invite Jesus? Why don't you invite Jesus into your situation? This is what he can do. This is what he will do. And so, I believe the Lord is looking at us and saying, what's your story like? What is your story? Can you allow him to script your story? Can we ask him to script our story? He's the greatest writer, he's the greatest poet, he's the greatest director. Can we allow him to script our stories if we have not asked him to do so? But even if we have, can we invite him, allow him to come into those moments, come into those areas and say, Lord, what you did, then do it again, God. I heard Abraham. I heard Joshua. I heard Joseph. I heard all these guys. I heard this lady speak, God. Would you do it again in my life? Would you do it again? I just want to share a couple of scripture. Uh, it's Psalm 139 and... Um, Psalm 139, verse 13, um, talks about right, God writing the story of our lives. Um, excuse me. Okay, Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. This is a psalmist, and he's testifying. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. In your book, they were all written. You know, he's written it. The greatest story greatest story, good thoughts, good story. He's written it all. And the psalm is saying, they were all written. The day is fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. So the thing is this, you know, can I go to him and live that out? Can I discover that born again train and live that out? Right? It's not automatic. He's written it out. But I need to live it out. I need to discover I need to walk with him to live that out because it's going to take his strength. It's going to take his resources to walk that out. Colosh, um, sorry, Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we discover, we walk with them, that we walk in them. The good works that he's prepared beforehand. Now that's his desire. Now that's the script, that's the story that he's writing about our lives, that we would discover, walk in them. And many times we maybe, we make a detour and move away from the script, but God is calling us back. 
through these testimonies is calling us back and say come back to the original script can you walk can you walk can i walk with you as you walk through this and you know just like all these stories spoke i don't think the woman at the well would have ever thought that uh you know her story would make such a difference in people's lives i don't think the woman who just who was caught in adultery would have ever thought that we'll be talking about her we don't know her name but but we'll be talking about her and our our hearts are stirred up and our our faith is built up because of her testimony so i just want to you know propose to us that our lives matter your life is not insignificant you are not a nobody you are not a nobody your life matters and he, the lord is maybe writing the story of your life rewriting the story in your life but that story needs to be shared that story your story needs to be shared you know i didn't have an opportunity to share my story recently my uncle passed away last week my dad's younger brother and and i was just thinking you know we were just watching the is the uk so uh they had that funeral uh when the cremation and and they had a service and uh, you know it was it was quite sad um but at at one point the uh, the casket was there and uh, and you know the uh, and just before the cremation they just closed the uh the curtains you know the curtains were closed and and that was it and i was just telling my wife you know it's sad it's like an end of an era um and then you you start and you think you know i wish uh, i didn't really have much conversations with him he was a very generous man and he in fact my first digital watch for me and my brother he presented is very very generous you know you would always give us the exciting gifts and um but i was thinking i've never shared my story really and the closest conversation that we had about faith was i think when he visited and he said so what are you doing and i said i know i'm working i'm serving i'm working as a you know um in church and this is what i do and and he said um, yeah i think you're doing something very important something that's very important you you know just do it he just encouraged me he said just go for it you're doing something that's very important and and that's the closest i didn't even open up then to talk about you know my story and why i did that and why i chose that i i could have but but the fact is that you know we sometimes think a uh, family they'll always be around people they'll always be around neighbors they'll always be around that business uh, partner they'll always be around and we say okay i'll i'll share sometime or maybe it won't make sense you know we uh, oh, how can i share some fear i'm not this personality right we make so many excuses what if they will laugh at me what if they turn violent what if they ridicule me so many reasons in our minds is reasons just like gideon would give you know i am the least i just like moses would moses said you know god i stammer i can't what do you mean but our story needs to be shared needs to be shared because god can use something out of that you know our story actually finds significance in his story and his story is the gospel our story when it becomes part of that it's significant very significant in the light of his story our story becomes significant and his story is that god so loved the world that he sent his son jesus to die on the cross that whoever believes in him would have everlasting life would have eternal life whoever believes in him and that's the start of our story that's the beginning of our race that's the beginning of our journey that's when we truly start living so if there's anyone here and you know you've never invited jesus you can do that you can just pray a simple prayer and say yes you know you've been writing about my life but god i really want to discover and i want to walk in your ways and our story can actually 
draw many people, many facets of our story and how God intervened in our lives. We might think, oh, it's actually a tragic thing. How can I share that? But God can use it. It's time to share our story because there's a distress signal that's going on in the world. There's an SOS that's coming from the world. You know, it goes like, you know, that's the SOS. It's coming from the world. It comes in different ways, right? Different worldviews. I'm just living for the weekend. Oh, I can't stand this pressure. So, you know, I, I, I need to drink. I need to do this. I need to do this. Oh, I, 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 don't, I can't really go home. I'd rather stay in the office and work. Seven days, no problem. Right? I can't afford to be a loser. I need to be on top, so I will work myself out. The SOS is coming out in different ways. I had a very interesting conversation, and uh, we'll close with that. A uh, conversation with a gentleman who called, and he, uh, and he said, you know, I have some questions. And I was a little cautious because he said, um, I want to know, I want to be part of this group, this church thing. And I have some questions and I want to be, I want to know certain things. So can I be part of that? I said, so what is it? You know, what, is, what is it that you want to know? So he said, you know, I have these questions about these Christians. I want to know Christian things. So then I asked him, you know, are you interested in Christianity and Islam and, you know, other, other worldviews as well? Or is it just Christianity? So he said, you know, other things I've studied, I've been saying, but... Um, you know, I'm just a little, I have some questions because I see that, uh, I see Christians are happy, he said, but not all Christians are like that. Some, you know, I see that they, there's no difference, but some are happy and uh, I want to know about, more about that. So I said, okay, is there some place we can meet and talk? He said, uh, see, sir, I'm a very busy man. Uh, today, I don't know what I'll do. Tomorrow, I don't know where I'll be. But if you don't mind, I'll call you whenever I'm free. Uh, and then I knew that he was genuine. He said, I, is, I'll call you and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you. And so we had an interesting conversation. I think it was for about half an hour or so. And then I shared, you know, I said, not everybody born in a Christian family is a Christian, first of all. You know, you say Christians are doing that, Christians are doing that. No. One who's a follower of Christ, he's a Christian. And then he also had this, you know, thought about, uh, about the world and how, how, why are you Christians colonizing the world? You know, uh, this Christian nation, why do you go and attack and call? And I said, you know, hey, hey, listen, listen, just like I said, this, when a person is a Christian, it means something, right? And uh, there's nothing, it's, 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 it's not as if the West is exporting Christianity. No, 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 it's not that at all, please. So we, these were the two things which were clarified in that conversation. And, um, but the thing is, there is an SOS. There is a distress call from the world. And God wants us to respond to that SOS because we are his hands and feet. We are a church. And God wants, to, wants us to be his hands, be his feet and, and respond to that SOS with our story. Knowing that our story is part of his story. Amen? Okay. We're just going to pray and I'm just going to call the worship team up and uh, even as we close... Um, first of all, just want to take some time to, you know, um, if there's anyone here and if, you, if you've never really, uh, this is your first time in church maybe, or maybe you've been in church all your life, but you've never ever thought about that question. If I die today, where will I be? You know, or you've never invited the Lord into your heart and I just want to give this time for you to respond to what you heard just now. And, and um, you can talk to Jesus. You know, you know, as Jesus is real. He came 2,000 years ago and he lived a sinless life and he carried our sin on the cross. And the Bible says that whoever believes on him will be saved. Um, so he removes what is separating us from him. And he's calling us, he's inviting us to live an abundant life. And he wants to be part of your life in what you are going through and change it for the better. It's always for the better. So if there's anyone like that here, you know, maybe you can pray. And prayer is talking, talking to God. So you can talk to him right now. You can 
maybe in your heart you can say this prayer and say lord uh, i believe lord jesus i believe that you died for me on the cross i believe that you rose again on the third day for my sins to be taken away and today come into my life i open the door of my heart come into my life i'm inviting you jesus change my life change my life just think about that what you prayed and and for some of us you know these testimonies are an invitation to tell the lord lord do it again god i'm in that place i could relate to some of these stories of what was shared i'm in that place god meet me and the lord will do it again maybe you're saying god i the walls are so high all i have is your word the lord wants to remind you oh you have more than enough the word of heaven the word which framed the heavens and the earth and for all of us the lord is saying you know um, it's time to share your story it's time to share the gospel just share and leave the consequence and leave the outcome of that to me says the lord you you can't do more than that the outcome the working of the heart the transformation and all that belongs to me says the lord that's my department i'll take care of that but can you share your story because in your story i have put some fingerprints there you know can you see my fingerprints on your story then when you were born oh i framed you when you you when no one was there in your mother's womb yes i i actually formed you can you see my fingerprints in your life you know when you went walk through those times alone and and you were crying and and saying god no one understands oh yes i was there right by your side and can you see my fingerprint and when you those times of celebration and rejoicing and i celebrated with you and can you see my fingerprints I believe the Lord would say, you know, I just want to be part of your life all through. But it's time to go and share. Share what I've done. Share what I can do and share the good news of what I've done for this entire this world. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening.